It's 2015. I'm watching YouTube reactionaries bitch about SJWs. It's 2019. The YouTube chuds are whining about a kid's show character not being sexy enough. It's 2017. The YouTube grifters are making money for screeching about how feminism killed Star Wars. It's 2016, and they're pissed about a black girl having armor like Iron Man in the comics. Just wait until they see her movie in 2022. It's 2019, and they're calling progressive content degenerate. It's 1940, and the Nazis are calling progressive content degenerate. It's 2018, and they're review bombing Black Panther before it's ever released. It's 2019, and they're making lots of Hot Pocket dollars by uploading different versions of them ranting about Brie Larson two or three times a day. All we ever see of right-wing grifters is their old videos. Over and over and over and over. <laughs> HBO's critically acclaimed Watchmen series, which just ended its nine-episode run, doesn't whitewash the true hidden history of our real world, as it weaves that history into the slightly alternate reality created by the 1985 graphic novel of the same name. The opening scene depicts one of the most atrocious acts ever perpetrated against black Americans, or any American for that matter. The show opens with the true events of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, in which white rioters burned down the entire black neighborhood of Greenwood, known then as Black Wall Street, due to the thriving black-owned businesses there. White Tulsa citizens killed as many as 300 people over the course of two days. The brutal and breathtaking spectacle of this Watchmen episode, shown through the eyes of a little black boy running for his life from a neighborhood movie theater, reaches into the soul of anyone of any color and pulls you into that trauma. A woman is shot from behind and collapses into the middle of the road. Overhead, we see airplanes bombing citizens in the only recorded incident of American on American air assault. Two black bodies are dragged behind a speeding car as clouds of dirt billow in their wake. Armed KKK members roam the streets. The series, which takes some thematic departures from the wealth of themes in the original graphic novel, also expands on some of the more timeless themes, such as trauma and how it can often form who we are, for better or worse. This is a show about legacy and trauma, and how they are two sides of the same coin. HBO's Watchmen explores this deftly, from the legacy of white supremacy slash the trauma of the African American experience, to Adrian Veidt's scheme from the source book, his legacy of saving humanity, and the traumas it created in his faux utopia. The show tackles cultural legacies and traumas that the original wasn't capable of addressing at the time. This is no slight against Alan Moore. The man was rightly concerned with the potential annihilation of the human race. And as a British gentleman who dabbles in serpent god sorcery, he was ill-equipped to comment on racial tensions in the United States. Moore's scope zeroed in on sexuality, and the hubris of those who seek to control or save the world, and the damage that surely resides in those who mask up to fight evil. I mean, seriously. Anybody who wears a mask and thinks he's doing good in the world is obviously fucking nuts, right? Anyone who says Watchmen got woke and missed the point is a fucking moron who either hasn't read the magnificent graphic novel, or didn't understand the subtext, or even just the regular text of the book. Maybe they watched the Zack Snyder adaptation and thought they got all the important bits from that. Alan Moore is not a conservative or a liberal, so anyone approaching his work from that frame is off to a bad start. Moore is a leftist anarchist. Here's a quote from the man himself about his political leanings. Well, I suppose I first got involved in radical politics as a matter of course during the late 1960s when it was part of the culture. The counterculture, as we called it then, was very eclectic and all-embracing. It included fashions of dress, styles of music, philosophical positions, and inevitably, political positions. And although there would be various political leanings coming to the fore from time to time, I suppose the overall consensus political standpoint was probably an anarchist one. Although probably back in those days when I was a very young teenager, I didn't necessarily put it into those terms. I was probably not familiar enough with the concepts of anarchy to actually label myself as such. 
it was later, as I went into my 20s and started to think about things more seriously, that I came to a conclusion that basically the only political standpoint that I could possibly adhere to would be an anarchist one. It furthermore occurred to me that basically anarchy is, in fact, the only political position that is actually possible. I believe that all other political states are, in fact, variations or outgrowths of the basic state of anarchy. After all, when you mention the idea of anarchy to most people, they will tell you what a bad idea it is because the biggest gang would just take over, which is pretty much how I see contemporary society. We live in a badly developed anarchist situation in which the biggest gang has taken over and have declared that there is not an anarchist situation, that it is a capitalist or a communist situation. But I tend to think that anarchy is the most natural form of politics for a human being to actually practice. All it means, the word, is no leaders, anarchon no leaders. With this quote in mind, we can begin to understand the source material and make our judgments on the HBO sequel from there, but trying to box it in with mainstream political ideologies is absurd and ignorant and just pointless. HBO's Watchmen is designed to trigger the reactionaries. Right-wing grifters such as the quartering, no bullshit, etc. often call modern films, TV, comics, and even advertisements SJW propaganda or forced diversity, and they behave as if this is some covert attempt by shadowy progressives to brainwash the masses, who it seems in their myopic view want nothing but cisgender, heteronormative, binary, and mostly white characters supporting the status quo. In the mind of the reactionary, Everyone is adverse to diversity such as they are, or at least they perpetuate this false notion as a means of normalizing resistance to inclusivity. The truth is that those quasi-fascist twats haven't the slightest hint of what things like Star Wars and comic books are usually about. The pathetic fact is that they bottom feed from stories and characters meant to unite people, and they pathologically devalue them either because they can't accept that their values are what have changed not popular fiction's values, or they just don't understand it, so they rage against it. Little idiot! These stories provide entry points to more practical and sophisticated philosophies and are like training wheels for nuanced contextual understandings of the world often for those who are limited in their ability to experience broader spectrums of life. Luke Skywalker didn't run off to become a Jedi because it's masculine and he wanted to make some cash. He did it because people were being hurt and oppressed and he had a chance to act. One of the most hilarious and absurd claims I see is SJW Marvel pandering to diversity or whatever. It's a personal kind of humor to me because I'm someone who learned about tolerance from reading X-Men. I learned about controlling anger from reading Hulk, and I learned the value of punching Nazis from Captain America. I literally learned to read more from comic books than actual books. This is probably why I used to dominate spelling bees, have near-perfect grammar skills compared to any of my peers, and wrote complex science fiction stories that won some contests. I speak with no small amount of authority when I say that Marvel Comics has been from its first issue and will remain until the day it eventually shuts down proud warriors for social justice. It's in the radioactive DNA of virtually every superhero, and even some villains, like Magneto. The reason I wear this helmet, besides it's just fun, is it's a reminder that the far right are intent upon stealing works of art which represent specific progressive ideologies, so they can pervert them to mean the exact opposite. They want the flair with none of the substance, because the substance goes against everything their YouTube algorithms have deluded them into believing. So they repeat their chud mantras, SJW, cuck, forced diversity, blah blah. Even failed comic artist Ethan Van Skyver has joined the grift to compensate for his career nosedive. He's gained the requisite mass to be a genuine YouTube chud. It's good solid work, if you're devoid of any dignity or self-awareness. A stable racket for a few years now, provided you can regurgitate hollow talking points and ignorant bullshit ad nauseum. <laughs> This wave of anti-SJW hysteria crested on the back of Gamergate, merged with the atheist community online, and coincided with the rise of Trump, as well as the malignant, regressive, crypto-fascist ideas taking root worldwide. I made a video I really hope you'll check out about my pet theory as to why reactionaries and most of the writers so goddamn deluded and insane. <laughs>
With that context in mind, I'd like to explain my personal history with Watchmen, one of Time Magazine's 100 Best Novels of All Time. I first read Watchmen when I was still a young Texas comic book nerd, so a rare breed, who didn't see himself as racist, but nevertheless had bigotry baked into my identity by proxy via cultural osmosis, something that's hard to recognize in oneself while you still are in such an environment. The themes explored were a bit too heady for me back then, but eventually I returned to it in 2005, uh, about four years before the very flawed masterpiece that is Zack Snyder's film. When I completed the book, I sat with it in my lap, a blank stare, mouth agape for a good 15 minutes, just trying to process all that I'd been absorbed. In hindsight, I probably should have paused between issues and processed, but the narrative was utterly transfixing. I read Watchmen again at least half a dozen times in the next year or two following that first reading, and I've probably read it close to 15 times total now. Usually just a chapter or two and set it down, read other things, come back to it later on. I find digesting it in various ways and multiple times has allowed me to get a pretty firm grip on the God-sized questions that it proposes. That's not to say that I have any answers for them. Two days after that first reading, I was scheduled for a new tattoo, which I'd already planned and designed for myself. It would be my first tattoo visible in short sleeves, the only one branding me as a counterculture degenerate in the small Texas town in which I resided. I decided to change the tattoo last minute, forgoing my own design for something grander, with more meaning. If I were to have a symbol, it would be one I respect. I got Dr. Manhattan's hydrogen atom symbol. I thought it was cool. I thought Manhattan's story was transcendent compared to not just superheroes, but most characters we see and read in popular fiction. No, I don't see myself as anything godly or powerful in a literal sense, and I don't entertain the notion of any god that would concern itself with human life, certainly not ones written about and worshipped and killed for. The power it represents to me is my own will and my ability to make myself the person I want to be, the best version of that person. John Osterman experienced a trauma the day he entered that intrinsic field generator and was seemingly torn apart, made into nothing. Trauma often feels this way, whether it's a sci-fi experiment gone wrong abuse of parents, rape, or the death of a loved one. Trauma makes us feel undone. The very core of our being can seem to unravel, cause us to question ourselves, our reality, and everything we thought we understood about life. But John Osterman, son of a watchmaker, recombined himself, reformed from virtually nothing but his basic essence, and became a man renewed with power, wisdom, and perception that those around him couldn't begin to comprehend. He was able to come back from his trauma much more powerful than before, by virtue of the very trauma that undid him. The inspiration and the irony here is beautiful to someone who's trying to find themselves again after a traumatic incident. We often wish to pack our traumas away and repress them and move on. But what happens when we face that trauma, even embrace the undoing of our being, and learn to harness our new perspective for the betterment of self and others? Trauma, living through trauma, and somehow finding the will the strength to let this unwelcome change to our status quo become a tool, a weapon if need be. So now we move forward to HBO's Watchmen. Before it began, I wasn't really on board. I kinda half expected a train wreck and a hefty shitting upon the legacy of Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons, what they crafted in the mid 80s. What could possibly be said that the original didn't address? Turns out quite a bit. Damon Lindelof and his team tapped into something profound and profoundly necessary. The brilliant angle that Lindelof approached from is one of a smaller and less urgent schism within society than the original's Cold War panic. Or, depending on your skin color and when you watch this, maybe it's larger, maybe it's more urgent. The original graphic novel explored how the US and the world would handle a god person and his swinging dong during familiar historical moments, twisting them ever so slightly in spots and still showcasing that despite the existence of blue Superman and some masked vigilantes, humanity is inherently flawed, and humans, no matter how well-intentioned, are often damaged. In fact, maybe those with the most lofty ambitions for the betterment of humanity are more damaged than those who simply exist within the muck. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's a negative thing to be damaged. HBO's take uses a finer lens to look at wounds in our culture that more overlooked, wounds that couldn't possibly heal due to any giant psychic squid. While Russia and the US put aside their nukes to unite against the pseudo-threat of extra-dimensional psychokinetic encephalopods, a long history of racism and justice, of repulsive inequality, festered like the untended infection that it is. 
HBO's Watchmen presents an alternate black experience in which reparations have been made to the ancestors of slaves. It showcases the single most charming black family on TV I've seen in recent memory, living a life of abundant love and dignity with their adopted white kids. The bold choice to have reparations, or redfordations as it's called in the show due to President Robert Redford being the one to enact the move, puts blacks on an even economic keel as most suburban white families. The ones who falsely believe they got to their comfy lives just because they earned it. And if the black folks would just conform or try harder or whatever bullshit they use to justify disparity, they'd get there too. This peeled back a layer of privilege that I was certainly aware of on some level, but maybe not always conscious of due to my upbringing. The thought in my family was that the black part of town was low class, dangerous, violent, and drug filled because, well, black people are gonna do what black people do. There wasn't a lot of overt, pure hatred in my family or even in my town that I saw, but that kind of casual racism, the kind racists don't think is racism, permeates every single inch of the South and many other parts of the country too. And it's getting more popular. It wasn't until I escaped that environment in the Deep South and experienced life in other places that I realized there are black communities that thrive. There are other areas where laws are more fair, where policing is not so aggressive. African Americans were crippled as a race the moment that they set unwilling foot on our soil. After playing a large part in building U.S. infrastructure, multiple industries, and lining the pockets of the nation's first mega-rich white people, they were unceremoniously freed from bondage without even an apology. The history of African Americans in the U.S. is a shameful atrocity that shines a light on the hypocrisy and double standards in our land of supposed equality, alleged justice, and privileged liberty. In HBO's Watchmen, black people have finally been given a karmic leg up. The government has apologized and made amends as best it can. Due to this economic application of some semblance of justice, black folks have access to prosperity, not just survival. While it's not explicitly stated, it's easy to deduce in the show that there are fewer ghettos, less systematic racism, and racial violence in this alternate USA. The playing field finally leveled, financial roadblocks removed, and the government's accountability have created a black experience many in the real world probably wouldn't dare to dream of. And despite this, or probably because of it, white supremacy has made a comeback in HBO's Watchmen. It never really went away, just went dormant and restructured. It rebranded, took more considerate approaches to how it could achieve its dipshit whiteopia. Wait, am I talking about the Watchmen show or real life right now? Ah, now we see exactly why the whitey righties despise this show. Why they review bombed it on Rotten Tomatoes. Why channels like this make videos in which they cite other reactionary channels as proof positive that no one wanted this. <laughs> It really is a circle jerk, man. Watchmen is ruined, they say. Woke garbage, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, if an impressionable white dude looking for others to blame for his shortcomings watched enough of these types of YouTube videos, it could really start to mesmerize them, make them do and say things a sane, rational person wouldn't. In the show, we learn that the original book's mysterious hero, Hooded Justice, was actually a black New York cop who, when he discovered that the KKK was operating with NYPD badges, took them on himself. Oh, and he was gay too. Tell me this wasn't designed in a lab to piss off reactionaries. I fucking love it. Then Lindelof ups his own ante by showing us that Dr. Manhattan has been living as a black man with a black woman raising some white kids for 10 years. It's a big glowing blue or maybe a lovely brown middle finger to the cult of Trump and anyone who thinks there's some inherent difference between people with different skin colors other than the skin color. We learn that Senator Keene, the grandson of the senator who enacted the Keene Act in the original graphic novel, which outlawed masks, has been leading the resurgent KKK under a new name, the Seventh Cavalry. They're wearing shitty replicas of Rorschach's mask from the original. After all, Rorschach's a sociopath, Dan. Practically a Nazi. Senator Keene's plan is to steal Dr. Manhattan's power and become president and God all at once. Why does he want to do this? Well, we're not racist. We're about restoring balance in those times when our country forgets the principles upon which it was founded. 
because the scales have tipped way too far. And it is extremely difficult to be a white man in America right now. <laughs> Holy shit. The brilliant trolling of racist chuds here is fucking... But Watchmen had one more trick up its sleeve. When Dr. Manhattan is seemingly killed, he gives his power to his badass masked cop wife, played by the gorgeous and talented Regina King. Fuck you. Fuck the plane you flew in on. Fuck them shoes. Fuck those socks with the bell on it. Fuck them cheap ass cigars. Fuck your yuck mouth teeth. Fuck your hairpiece. Fuck your chocolate. Fuck Guy Ritchie. Fuck Prince William. Fuck the Queen. This is America. Now get the fuck out my hotel room. And if I see you in the street, I'm slapping the shit out of you. Let's just enjoy this for a moment. Now in slow motion. All right, moving on. The Tulsa Massacre of 1921 is finally getting renewed interest. Just this week, the city of Tulsa is investigating what could be mass graves from the murders of Black Wall Street. History recorded just 36 deaths in that horrific forgotten event, but white Oklahomans of 1921 wrote that history, which means it did not memorialize or respect the lives lost, even remotely. There are believed to be hundreds more African-American corpses buried in Tulsa. Unmarked graves, forgotten. Each represents a lost life, but also a loss of opportunity for that person's family, loss of prosperity for their descendants, a loss of dignity for their race, as if they needed to lose any more dignity at the hands of white men. This event became a tragic and glossed over footnote in our long history of weak-minded Caucasian villains who believe themselves superior. Another setback for a community that had managed to work its way from bondage to the freedom outlined in our country's established ideals. The black people of Tulsa played the game from a disadvantage and they won it to the best extent they could in the early 20th century and ended up paying the spiteful white man's price for it. As a white dude who spent his formative years with blinders on to social disparity, and even occasionally leaning into my more bigoted assumptions, HBO's Watchmen was like being teleported by Dr. Manhattan into a time and place that's familiar, yet I'm seeing it from a new angle, with empathy and more fully formed notions of equality. I teared up a couple of times at some of the ways in which black people suffered in the past, especially when it's clear some of those ways still exist. Some are making a comeback here in the US, in the 21st century, post black president. Fuck that. Fuck white supremacy, it's a false notion and it's evil. Fuck no bullshit, the quartering, and whatever the chud's name is in the video I'm gonna edit in right here. I don't care enough to even remind myself. In the show's season finale, the main character talks to her grandfather, the former hooded justice, who tells her that people wear masks to hide their fear and their pain. You can't heal, wearing a mask, he says. Wounds need air to heal. And he's right. The reason we still haven't come to terms with our past in this country, the reason these old wounds never really healed, is because we cover them up. We wear the mask of equality and allows most of us to pretend injustice is just a thing of the past. But wounds need air to heal. I hope you found value in this video, and I'd love feedback, especially from any black viewers I might have, and I'm always willing to learn more, and to see more clearly, and to work harder. I humbly ask you to educate me with your experience. If you prefer to do that in private, my email is in the description. If you don't mind being public, it'd be great to see some conversations about this in the comments. I'll make sure to moderate it so that there's nothing shitty going on. If you like what I do here, please consider being a Patreon supporter for as little as a dollar a month. 
or just as supportive, you could grab a t-shirt or a hoodie or a mug from the merch shop. There's plenty there from leggings to stickers to sweaters and comfy socks. I hope you all have a merry war on Christmas. Peace, love, context.